So for those of you who have cell phones, it would be great if you extinguish them. Don't just turn them off, but turn them all the way off. We have electromagnetically sensitive people in the audience, and they and I would appreciate it. First of all, thanks everyone for coming out. And uh, the uh, topic of the day is the dark side of smart meters, and primarily to tell you what PG&E doesn't. Uh, I am Rob States, briefly uh, three uh, MS degrees, not in uh, microwave technology. Uh, one would wonder why listen to me. So I tend to list relevant work experiences when I'm giving a talk. Uh, for about two years, I consulted for Microsource that makes microwave synthesizers up in uh, uh, Santa Rosa. Uh, and I was doing, uh, you know, ba basically circuit troubleshooting for those guys. Uh, I've designed uh, several uh, uh, mainstream power generating pieces of equipment uh, in the grid, and I'm the planet's leading expert on pulsed impingement. I sold a job to the Department of Energy, and this technology is capable of reducing the planet's energy consumption by about three quarters of a percent. That's one invention. Three quarters of a percent reduction is basically doubles the efficiency of. Uh, uh, drying of paper. <clears throat> so uh, the the point being that I have uh, expertise both in the microwave side and in the power generation side. Uh, so the this is kind of the introduction for the uh, afternoon. So the idea is to to basically outline what is a smart meter, and then uh, the health impacts, which are like drive you nuts, and the privacy impact, which will double drive you nuts. And the idea is to create an action plan, which since I'm an engineer, I don't have the action plan, but we have Larry Bragman here who does have an action plan. So let's describe what we're talking about here, which is a, uh, the power grid. And during a typical day, there is lots of power consumption during the middle of the day, and there isn't very much in the middle of the night. And so the primary reason for having smart meters is to move some of this demand over to there. So uh, basically, a smart meter is therefore responsible for zero reduction in usage, zero reduction. It is primarily a device that moves power from one place to another. Unlike, for example, superconducting uh, um, uh, high tension lines, okay, those would be responsible for a 30% increase in total efficiency and a total reduction in uh, uh, usage of power, usage of fuel to generate the power. Why am I not doing a good job here? Uh, but these meters of themselves are responsible for no reduction in the consumption of electricity. The uh, customer's behavior is responsible, and uh, on a good day, uh, PG&E cites the number 4 to 12 percent, okay? So if you think of a typical uh, $100 a month power bill, that's like 40 bucks a year. I mean, how much uh, uh, customer sort of activity are you going to get out of uh, that fairly small amount of uh, money. <clears throat> so that factors into, uh, well, I'll get back to that. This is sil off of Silver Springs' um, website that basically describes the system. And as you can see, it's very simple. Any straightforward questions for that? Let me give you the, the quick tour de force. Over here is your house. And here is a smart meter that's connected to your house. And eventually, this smart meter then talks to PG&E, which is over here somewhere. But what it also does is it talks to the neighbor's meter, and that to the neighbor's meter, and that to the neighbor. And what we're showing here is that this is what's called net topology. That means your meter has to send about 700 numbers a day to PG&E so that they know time of day use for your house. OK, that only takes 45 seconds. But it may not be talking directly to a cell tower. It may be talking, which is this thing right here. It may not be in direct line of sight to a cell tower. So it will talk to its neighboring smart meter. That neighboring smart meter will talk to another neighboring smart meter. And so uh, the duty cycle, the PG&E sites, is for this meter talking, let's say this meter talking directly to a cell tower. But what they are leaving out of the details are this meter may be collecting data from tens to dozens to hundreds of other meters. In fact, the duty cycle of this thing could be nearly continuous. Uh, so it is an unknown factor. Now, I'm in the, uh, uh, in the civil engineering uh, fire life safety business. 
where we are designing uh, civil engineering structures for safety of individuals. And uh, in those structures, we are overwhelmingly conservative. We make the most uh, severe assumptions to preserve, preserve human life. In this system, that says the thing is on most of the time. And that violates some of the major uh, tenets of how these systems have been uh, sold by PG&E and how they have been uh, approved by the FCC. So basically, uh, this baby uh, gives power to your system, to your house, and it sits there and thinks about the power and then sends its thoughts back. Uh, there is, well, let's say, and this smart meter also has a second channel of communication where it talks directly to what are called smart-enabled appliances inside of your house. And currently, there are none or virtually few smart appliances, but uh, the CPUC wants to change that. This is a, the radiation pattern from a typical smart meter. They have what is called a dipole antenna, and it radiates radially. So if the antenna is like this, it radiates out this way and doesn't radiate very much out this way. And this is required so that uh, it can both talk to a cell tower, which may be slightly above it but at a shallow angle, or to a neighboring smart meter, which would be a lateral communication. But what is in the lateral uh, uh, distance between this meter and the next smart meter, that's people, that's houses, that the majority of the radiation that comes off of this is not for communication. It's wasted radiation that goes to individuals and structures in the general vicinity. Uh, cell phones use this style of antenna exclusively, and uh, part of it goes uh, directly into your head, which is a major concern. If you read the fine print on an iPhone, it says, always use the iPhone five-eighths of an inch away from your head. That means you are told in the fine print six point type in the sub paragraph of some appendix to hold the thing with an air gap between your head because when it is touching your head, this radiation is actually above the FCC limit. This is strictly optional. These antenna could be designed as high gain uh, transmitters and all it would mean is you either put it on this side of your head where the cell tower is this way or this side of your head where the cell tower is that way and you could drop the uh, energy consumption or let's say the energy uh, wasted to your head by a factor of a thousand. It would be fairly easy to design. But in 1996, the Telecommunications Act uh, relieved them of uh, any uh, local requirements to get the position of the cell towers approved. So they can put a cell tower anywhere they want. And the uh, writer in 1998 uh, resolved them of any liability. So uh, they are in a, a position of not requiring to consider your health when they're either designing the system or designing the phones. And more convenience is the sales feature, and that is what's been driving this industry is more convenience. Uh, a smart meter typically goes on the outside of your house. And uh, so there it is located. But what's directly on the other side of this that's the interior of your house. So because we know that this is a laterally transmitting device, uh, on the other side, this is being laterally transmitted through the wall. So if you're sleeping over here, you're getting, self, you're getting um, radiation from this meter uh, you know, eight hours a day. If this is your office, uh, you know, a high occupancy area, uh, the uh, exposure could be substantial. So let's discuss the health uh, ramifications of this piece of equipment. Uh, we are fairly familiar with ionizing radiation, which, <clears throat> say, a, uh, uh, an X-ray uh, hits your cell uh, inside of the cell's nucleus. It breaks uh, a DNA molecule. And from then on, the children of this cell have a defective DNA, which turns on a RAS gene or some other naughty thing. And this cell then replicates and becomes a, a tumor. So this is a well-known, well-understood action path, but this is like an X-ray or a cosmic ray. It is an extremely high energy piece of radiation, and uh, cell phones and smart meters put out much lower frequencies, typically 900 megahertz. And so uh, we are uh, assured by some scientists that ionizing radiation is required for this. But in fact, uh, non-ionizing radiation disrupts van der Waals bonds, and that is the major bond uh, during uh, creation of proteins and replication of DNA. And uh, you may think of a covalent bond as the rubber on the bottom of your shoe. If you want to get the rubber off, you have to scrape it or you have to cut it. It's very ruggedly bonded to your shoe. But uh, 
a Van der Waals bond is like the mud that's on the bottom of your shoe. It's fairly easy to scrape off. If you rinse it off, it comes off easily. That's a low energy bond. And you have much lower frequencies that can disrupt these. You are producing roughly 3,000 miles of DNA per day. You're making about 20 billion new cells. Each one has got about three feet. You figure it out. It's like 3,000 miles. You're zipping this stuff out like crazy. And every time there is a disruption, uh, from RF radiation, you are running the risk of creating an error either in DNA transcription or in the creation of a protein. This fuzzy slide is looking at an individual who is sensitive to microwave radiation. In this case, the person is talking on a 900 megahertz uh, uh, handheld phone. That means it's not even a cell phone. It's a phone that only talks to a base station that's a few feet away, and it's a convenience so that you don't have a wire. This is a normal person, and when they talk on this 900 megahertz phone, there is virtually no change in their uh, physiological condition. But this person, their heart rate goes from roughly 68 up to 122, and the heart rate becomes irregular. And as soon as you turn the phone off, they return to normal sinus rhythm. This is one of many uh, sensitivity issues with microwave radiation. This is a normal person. This is a sensitive person. How many sensitive people are there in a general population? And this, uh, this sweetest study indicates that there's roughly 3% of the population that is severely sensitive to microwave radiation. And you put smart meters in a residential area, and these people either have to move or they have to heavily shield their houses. 35% of the population is moderately uh, sensitive. So we are in a gray area here where the impact on um, uh, property values and the impact on the population in general is, is relatively significant. This is a study done in Spain where directly underneath the cell tower, they are mapping out as a function of distance, and this is uh, 300 meters, so that's like an eighth of a mile, something like that, about 1,000 feet, uh, <clears throat> uh, from close to, to that far away from a cell tower, the various um, uh, psychological and physical symptoms that people experience. And right underneath the cell tower, we're looking at 80%, 70 plus percent of the people uh, experience fatigue, uh, drowsiness, uh, headaches, uh, uh, discomfort feelings, depression. So even the existing cell towers are generating significant problems, health problems for people nearby. Uh, this is a quick example of what we're dealing with in the case of an industry that's generating $500 billion worth of uh, market revenue a year. Uh, this is a Reuters News Service, uh, October 13th, 2009, just last year. And they were reporting on a South Korean study that studied uh, the links between mobile phones and tumors. And at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, the Reuters News Feed said, high-quality studies often show potential cancer link. Underneath that, the second bullet said,